Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is George Werthner. He's the Ecological Projects Director for the Foundation for Deep Ecology. He's an ecologist and wildlands activist. He's published 37 books on environmental issues and natural history, including such environmentally focused books as Welfare Ranching, Wildfire, Thrillcraft, Energy, and most recently, Keeping the Wild. So thank you so much for being on the program, and thank you for your work. A pleasure to be here, Derek. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so my first, I, I guess what I want to talk about today is predators. So can we talk, I would like to talk about the importance of predators in the real world and um, also this culture's really um, messed up relationship with predators. It seems to have very much of a hate relationship with predators. Well, you're exactly right. Um, I I think that predator management, if you want to call it that, which usually means killing them, um, is uh, sort of a uh, example of the mindset that comes with the concept that humans should be dominating and controlling the planet, which is part of this larger, uh, what some people call the neo-green movement or whatever, which within the context of that, the, the idea is that we are now affecting the planet in so many ways. There's no such thing as wild places or, or wild animals left anymore uh, in, in truth, that everything is subject to human control and manipulation. And not only is that happening, but that it's a good thing and that we ought to, you know, sort of pony up and take our place as uh, captains of the universe. And I think that mindset is uh, exemplified by our attitudes towards uh, predators. And uh, I'll give you some uh, background first on on predators and why um, we uh, why they're important and why we probably have that attitude. And then give some examples, I think, of how that attitude uh, is, is causing a lot of problems with predators that are unnecessary. And the first thing I, I would go, I'll, I'll, I'll specifically talk about predators in, the, in North America, because I'm not really familiar with things like lions and tigers to any great degree. But, but most of what I say will apply to predators around the world. Uh, in North America, the prime larger predators, and that's what I'm going to focus on, are wolves, uh, cougars, or mountain lions, as they're called, and then uh, the black bears, uh, grizzly bears, and coyotes. And those predators have uh, a very important ecological function uh, in ecosystems. They, um, uh, if, if you want to have a value judgment about them, you can say that the benefits of predators is that they um, uh, filter out uh, uh, weaker animals um, that uh, are either um, not maladapted for for the uh, particular uh, landscape, um, and they can uh, keep uh, numbers of their prey from getting so large as to cause problems, for example, uh, in, in some places, uh, high numbers of, of elk or moose, um, for example, which are common prey of wolves, uh, can uh, damage uh, plants uh, by excessive browsing. And uh, predators um, also shift the habitat use of some of those animals. So, for example, uh, elk might have a tendency to hang out in uh, lower country near streams uh, when there's no predators present, but uh, will be more widely dispersed uh, when there are predators like wolves. And the interesting thing uh, about how there's ripple effects all the way through the ecosystem, and I'll give you a number of examples of that. For example, dispersing elk away from streams um, and more widely distributed on the landscape in a place like Yellowstone or other places where there are bears um, means that those animals are more likely to die, whether from predators and or, you know, accident, starvation, or whether away from valley bottoms where most of the roads are. So if you're a grizzly bear and you find an elk that's died, if it dies next to a road, you're not likely to feed on it because 
most bears and, and a lot of other animals like that shy away from human contact. But if it dies a mile or two away from a road, it's more likely to be a, a, a benefit to that bear. And that's one result of having the predators sort of disperse um, prey animals like elk around. Another way that they can influence the landscape and how things work, um, there are all sorts of um, effects, uh, ripple effects, you might say, of having um, predators in the landscape. Like, you know, one of the things you would never expect, but um, wolves, for example, because they can keep elk away from repairing areas, uh, means that, and the repairing areas are those places along creeks, means that uh, the creek uh, beds and uh, streamside vegetation is in better shape. Better shaped streamside vegetation helps to hold streams banks together and creates habitat for uh, insects, which increases the food for trout and other fish. So most people would never see the connection of having wolves back on the landscape and more trout in a stream, which in turn would be more food for fish-eating birds like osprey or eagles uh, or uh, other fish-eating mammals like mink and otter. And uh, another example of that same sort of thing, um, because uh, of the tendency of wolves to either chase away or even kill coyotes, um, you can have uh, more rodents around, coyotes like to feed on small rodents, uh, more rodents around the perimeter and, and in the vicinity of wolf dens because of the concentration of wolves and the lack of coyotes there, which in turn creates more food for hawks and other uh, birds of prey that feed on small rodents. Uh, another example is um, coyotes will feed on uh, uh, one of the major predators on pronghorn antelope fawn. And again, if you have uh, wolves in the present in the area, you reduce the predation by coyotes on um, antelope uh, fawn. So these ripple effects and many others that we're probably not aware of, but these are some of the ones that have been found and documented, um, ripple through the whole ecosystem. And when we eliminate the um, uh, top predators like that, then we have uh, problems. For example, in the eastern United States, uh, the high numbers of white-tailed deer, uh, due to partially a lack of predators, um, as well as management policies by fish and game departments trying to maximize the number of white-tailed deer, uh, have uh, reduced the regeneration of some forest tree species because they uh, are eaten by the deer. And also because of high deer numbers can um, reduce the small shrubs and flowers on the uh, forest floor, uh, it reduces hiding cover for ground nesting birds, which have declined in some eastern forests. So these are many examples of why having predators on the landscape uh, will keep ecological processes and ecosystems um, healthier, so to speak, uh, or functioning more properly. And um, But at the same time, of course, particularly the larger predators are seen as competitors uh, with humans. So hunters, in particular, um, are very much often uh, express negative views about uh, wolves and mountain lions and so forth. And, you know, a lot of them will say, you know, I'm not against all wolves and 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 mountain lions present, uh, just that there aren't too many of them. But the problem with that is. If you don't have too many of them, you don't get the ecological processes. In other words, if you just have some token wolves or some token mountain lions, they won't have that uh, top-down effect uh, on the other species and will not have the ecological benefits that result. And um, the same thing and the other major group that generally doesn't like predators are um, ranchers and farmers uh, because their livestock is uh, vulnerable to predators as well. But one of the things that we find or are finding is that, um, and this is pretty new uh, information, 
uh, is that by trying to kill predators, whether it's coyotes, whether it's wolves, whether it's cougars or bears, um, we disrupt the social uh, relationships of those animals. And, and you know, these animals are just not, um, you know, a, a, a cog in, a, uh, in gear. Uh, they are uh, they they have interrelationships between each other as well as other uh, species. So, for example, um, when you have uh, uh, you kill mountain lions, a lot of hunters try to kill the largest male mountain lions when they hunt. And male mountain lions usually have a territory that overlaps four or five female mountain lions, and what they do is they tend to keep younger males out of that territory, and and they will even kill a young male if they uh, have the opportunity. And that uh, territory then, where that male is the dominant male, um, uh, has a lot fewer, uh, first of all, has fewer mountain lions in it, and it has, uh, you don't get to be a dominant male mountain lion by being stupid, uh, by being uh, bold, and by being uh, careless about how you are around uh, humans. And so when the hunter takes out that dominant male mountain lion, um, it upsets the apple cart, so to speak. Now you have no, no individual uh, uh, mountain lion uh, patrolling that territory, and you may get two, three, four uh, young mountain lions rushing into that territory trying to occupy it. Now the problem is, is um, young mountain lions are not very skillful at uh, capturing prey. They don't know the territory either. They may not know where the deer hang out, or the elk hang out, or the calving grounds of a uh, elk herd, and so forth. And as a result, they're going to be less efficient at providing their own food, particularly wild food. And if there's any domestic livestock around, they're going to be more inclined to go after the domestic livestock because they're not as skillful hunters, because they're like teenage boys, bolder, less careful, and uh, and, and and also um, more desperate. And so they've done a few places where they've uh, done studies and shown that as the population of mountain lions declines, uh, the number of complaints about uh, predation uh, uh, and, and just other encounters, in other words, mountain lions wandering through somebody's backyard or something, is increased. And that has a lot to do with the destabilization of the social system. And in a similar way, it also affects females um, because, for example, you can't usually tell whether you've got a male or female mountain lion just you know, quickly. Uh, so if you see a mountain lion cross the road and you just shoot at it, you just, in fact, you're more likely to probably kill a female than a male because they're a little more numerous. And um, and the females are uh, also uh, have can have um, young anytime during the year. So you don't know that you haven't killed a mother with cubs that uh, are still not fully able to uh, feed themselves. And again, you set up a situation then where you have a lot of young um, uh, mountain lions wandering around who are not skillful, who aren't good hunters, who are bold and desperate. And again, you've set up the conflicts. Now, the same thing applies to other um, predators. Uh, I'll use an example with with wolves. Um, most fish and game departments manage for uh, populations. What I mean by that is they say uh, we want uh, 20 wolves in this particular area. I'm just going to use that number. Um, and we're going to, if there's if there's 30 wolves, we're going to try to shoot or or otherwise trap them or reduce them to we get 20. And 20 is fine because that means they're not going to go extinct in that area. So we're going to have 20 wolves. But the they don't pay attention to what the population structure is of those 20 wolves. And you can have 20 wolves in one pack, or you can have 20 wolves in, uh, you know, multiple packs. But the difference in the age structure and the population structure can be very different, and the outcome of how those animals behave is different then. So, for example, if you had um, uh, four wolf packs 
uh, each with five animals in it. That's 20 wolves. But um, with four uh, wolf packs, uh, you would likely have uh, two adult wolves, and, and we'll say each of those four packs has three pups. So you've got 12 pups. You've got uh, the four packs um, with the uh, two adults. Or you can have a pack of 20, which is much more likely to have far more adults. We'll just for argument's sake say there's 15 adults and only five pups. The, the larger pack is going to be able to, one, hold on to a territory easier because it can dominate other wolves. It's also uh, going to be able to, uh, if it kills an elk or a deer, guard that carcass and com more completely consume it than if you're just a, a, a small pack and, you know, you're out, you kill an elk and you got to bring the meat back to the den where the other adult is. By the time you get back, uh, ravens, coyotes, and so forth may have well consumed it. So uh, as a result, uh, the smaller packs um, are more likely actually to kill more elk and deer, and uh, they are also more likely to attack livestock because of the same reasons like I talked about with uh, mountain lions in that they are uh, likely to be younger, less experienced, and have uh, uh, less knowledge of their particular terrain. So what all this says is that predator control and hunting and trapping, who, which agencies, whether it's fish and game agencies or, or the federal government's um, animal damage control unit that um, go out and kill predators, uh, are always saying they're doing it to reduce conflicts with humans. But because they ignore these social relationships among predators, there's good evidence to suggest that they are actually creating more problems, which in turn, Ben, just ups the ante because, okay, you just destabilize these, this population. We'll just use uh, the mountain lions as an example. And so now you're having more livestock killed and you're having mountain lions show up in people's backyards and people say, oh, well, we, we need to kill even more mountain lions. And, of course, the fish and game agencies and the uh, um, federal government uh, animal damage control are more than happy to accommodate that. And so we have this never-ending self uh, uh, fulfilling feedback system whereby we kill predators, we disrupt the social relationships, uh, and then that causes more conflicts, which then increases the demands for more control, and we are back to uh, killing more predators uh, more and more of the time. And we've seen this for decades with coyotes, where uh, in particular we've been killing coyotes for Oh, since for a hundred years now, with no uh, um, end in sight, so to speak, because what happens is um, the coyotes bounce back, and uh, and we uh, get more calls for predator control, and, and it just continues. It it seems that um, uh, I I guess part of the Part of the the underlying theme seems to be that um, a lot of people in this sort of managerial society somehow believe that they know better how to manage a forest or manage a prairie than the forest or prairie does. And that yes, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one more thing about that, which is there's this great line by David Ehrenfeld, that the world is not only more complex than we think it is, it's more complex than we're capable of thinking. That is exactly my <laughs> what I would conclude from what I was just saying. And and, and one of the um, uh, issues or, or themes that I emphasize all the time is that, um, we we don't even know the right questions to ask in many cases in order to get of the proper answer, because it doesn't even occur to us to ask those questions. Well, for crying out loud, I, I recently, um, after you know several thousand years of agriculture and deforestation and everything else, um, scientists have finally realized that the um, bacterial composition in soil is dramatically different underneath a redwood tree than it is in a meadow 30 feet away. And 
it seems to me they only just realized this after they're conducting this experiment on a world scale of you know dramatically changing entire biomes and it's just it's just stunning to me. I guess I want to go on about this for a second because, you know, I have Crohn's disease, which is a disease of civilization. As people, as a as a as a as a place industrializes, um, they get more. They, Crohn's disease goes up, and there are a bunch of questions as to what the cause is. And one of the one of the very strong theories at this point is that um, as people industrialize, their hygiene improves, and as their hygiene improves. They have fewer intestinal parasites, and Crohn's is autoimmune, and um, one of the things that even the FDA says is okay to do, and I actually do it, is to ingest whipworms because they modulate your immune system. And my point is, if we, if we are, if we can't, it strikes me as completely insane to think that you can manage a forest when we don't even know this, the interactions that happen on when I walk around without bare feet, I could end up with Crohn's disease. You see what I'm getting at? It's like, for- oh yeah, uh, I totally agree. And in fact, you know, <coughs> getting back to the Ehrenfeld um, quote, uh, I, or, or trying to make an analogy to the medical profession, uh, I, I think we're, we're our understanding of how ecosystems work. Is at the same level as when we used to bleed, uh, you know, patients to get rid of their bad blood, uh, assuming that, uh, and, and, and in a lot of ways it's sort of analogous to our approach to predators. You, you know, you, you, you go out and you have to uh, bleed the patient to get rid of the bad blood, and, and uh, if the patient dies, well, it's because you didn't get enough blood out or you didn't kill enough predators. And uh, and if the patient survives, well, it's because you bled him, or if the uh, you know whatever it is, there's fewer livestock conflicts, or there's more elk, or whatever. You just attribute it to predators uh, killing the predators when uh, it may have very little, if nothing, to do with uh, the results you've seen. And um, so uh, you know, I, I, you know, we spend a lot more time trying to understand human medical uh, situation and health, and as you point out. Our knowledge there is, you know, still uh, very rudimentary, and and uh, you know, ecosystems are uh, uh, and and those kind of processes are even more complex, and uh, we spend less time trying to understand them. And and I think part of the, you know, this is getting back to the beginning point, and part of the reason we've spent less time trying to understand is because we already think we know everything. <laughs> or enough anyway to to manipulate things on a large scale and and it's always amazed me uh, i i go on field trips with um foresters and range guys and and uh uh others and they'll they'll tell you all the mistakes they made in the past a, a good example in, in in the forest is it was not uncommon that long ago to uh to pull logs out of streams in the Pacific coast here to, on the thought that you were going to improve salmon and steelhead migrations by getting rid of the obstacles or what were thought to be obstacles in the stream. And then finally somebody at some point said, well, I wonder what benefit or what role in the ecosystem those logs in the stream play. And when they started looking into that, they found, well, you know, the logs slow down the current which reduces erosion. It creates uh, habitat for uh, insects that uh, fish feed upon. It provides resting uh, areas because of the slower velocity behind them for migration, uh, migrating fish like salmon and, and so forth. Uh, and now in some places, the Forest Service is cutting down trees and dragging them to the streams to put them back in. And, um, so the the point of that being that uh, we we tend to you know I'll have foresters admit that that uh, was a mistake in the past, but now they'll tell me. But we we now know enough that we can do all this other manipulation uh, because we we now understand it completely. There's no humility or understanding or learning from the past mistakes that that perhaps uh, we ought to go forward with real care and, and constantly questioning our assumptions. And I, and I just don't see uh, enough of that, um, in particularly in the mindset that thinks that we need to manage the, uh, you know, the entire planet. 
Um, actually, I want to I want to read you something um, from that I just wrote in my new book. Um, it's about human supremacism, and uh, I have to find it real quick. It's just it's it's an ex- because this whole this whole management notion just bothers me so much. Um, uh, oh, here it is. If a doctor killed or injured every single patient he saw, would you trust your life to this doctor? If a cop bungled every single case she handled, would you want to investigate the death of your loved one? If every single bridge built by a certain engineer collapsed, would you want him building bridges over which you and those you love would travel? If a financial advisor gave you bad advice every single time she opened her mouth, would you trust her with your financial future? And unfortunately, this is really the track record for managers. I asked Tom Butler this question a few weeks ago, and are there any are there any landscapes that human supremacists so i mean i'm not talking about indigenous people living long term with their land i'm not calling that management okay um mm-hmm. are there any landscapes that have been managed um especially for extraction that have not been seriously harmed by the management process well you know uh just off the top of my head, my answer would be no. There, there. Uh, as as somebody who's always a little cautious, somebody yeah, yeah, might yeah. think of some examples. But um, but in general, as a general, uh, especially getting to your point about uh, doing things for commercial profit, that very much skews uh, what happens. Like uh, <clears throat> what I tell people, so, you know, I'm very skeptical of, of forestry, for example, and 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 foresters' ability to. Uh, extract uh, wood from the forest. I'm not sure that we can extract any wood on a commercial, and maybe never, not even on a non-commercial, but certainly at the level that makes economic sense to take wood out of the forest. Uh, I really wonder if that's too much wood to be taking away, uh, because well, wood love- is very important to the forest ecosystem in a whole lot of ways. So. I love this line by John Livingston, there is no surplus in nature. I mean, Anything you mm-hmm. take out of the natural community is you're taking away someone's food or mm-hmm. someone's home. And right. so it seems to me, and this is not just true, I believe, with wood. I believe it's true for salmon, that you can take salmon out of the stream and basically you've got to poop them you know, within 20 miles of the stream or within, the, within, the, within that biotic community because that's food for that community. Exactly. I, I, I raised that whole issue about salmon or Oh, about 20 years ago, wondering if commercial sal- you know, there was such a thing as a sustainable commercial salmon fishery for exactly that reason, because, you know, the salmon come out of the ocean, they transport nutrients upstream into places that are usually nutrient poor, uh, where they die, and they, uh, you know, plus providing food all along the way, and then, uh, as you're, you're probably aware of some of that, uh, research where they found that, uh, you know, a bear eats a salmon and then poops in the woods and then the tree takes up those nutrients and becomes part of the forest. So the salmon's body is actually eventually converted into a tree, for example. Uh, and it's really pretty cool that those kind of relationships exist. And and so can you take uh, a large amount of that, you know, fish stock uh, away from a stream uh, without, over the long term, uh, impoverishing it, you know, uh, that's a question I would always ask, and uh, I don't necessarily have the answer to it, but the fact is is that many people who are involved in uh, managing fisheries, for example, uh, don't really ask that question in the first place, and that's the blindness that we have to a lot of these uh, commercial activities be- because of our desire to use them and, of course, rationalize the use of those uh, whatever it is, uh, trees, salmon, you know, elk or whatever, uh, we are reluctant to uh, question uh, whether the the use of those things is uh, really can be sustained long term. When I find um, a lot of uh, when people talk about sustainability, um, they're talking about, for example, I'll use forestry as an example. Uh, they're talking talking about having a sustainable amount of wood for the mill and for providing for the local economy, not necessarily 
uh, of ecological st sustainability of what is good for the forest ecosystem over the long term. And that, you know, we can, you know, bring it back to predators and, and, and wildlife management. Um, it's the same thing. What is good for the long term uh, in terms of uh, ecosystems of having, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the animals that would be there as dictated by natural processes, when we distort those numbers one way or another, whether we're killing predators or trying to have more white-tailed deer, um, uh, in either case, we're deviating from what would likely be there otherwise, and uh, and and few people bother to ask, well, what are what are the consequences of that? So I want to go back to the question. I sort of asked the question, and didn't really give you the opportunity to answer that. Who can better manage a forest, a forest or especially industrial humans? Well, <laughs> you're asking. <laughs> Somebody who's biased, but I definitely think that the, the my my uh, my m metric or or what I go by is, <clears throat> you know, is that uh, the the forest uh, to answer your question is is, is uh, uh, if we're going to anthropomorphize knows better than we can what is appropriate, and and that's and and and, and that's why when when you know some of these people. Uh, getting taking it back to predators, say, well, you know, we 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 can have 20 wolves here, and and that's fine. Uh, and my response is, well, maybe naturally there'd be 50 wolves there. So how do you know that you know that isn't the right number? How do you know what is the right number? I don't think you can know that. So uh, what I trust is if there's 50 wolves, that's the right number. If there's 10 wolves, that's the right number. Uh, but uh, so long as we're not interfering uh, in how that number uh, uh, comes about, and uh, and I assume that um, at times there will be more wolves, every time there will be less wolves, and there will be more elk and less elk, and so forth. And 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 we strive, and this is probably you know part of our whole genetic code. We strive for safety and and security, and and so we want predictability. I mean that's probably you know something that comes from. A long, long time ago. So we want to know that there's going to be, you know, uh, 100,000 elk in a certain state or something like that. And the Fish and Game Department wants to know there's going to be 100,000 elk. And so it strives to keep it at this number of animals that it thinks is the ideal. And yet, what you see oftentimes in nature is that there's a lot of fluctuation, and and different events will uh, uh, change. Um, you know, for using elk in the will change the number of elk and change the relationship of wolves and, and mountain lion to the elk and so forth. And and I don't think it's proper to try to second guess all that. I think I, I was interviewing Thomas Berry 20 years ago or so, and, and I was saying something about how I thought the world should be, you know, wasn't the world in a state of dynamic equilibrium or something and you know just that that would be what a force is and he said no he didn't think so he thought it was sort of a creative disequilibrium and and the reason i say that is because i think it it i think that you and he are using different languages say much the same thing that you can have an elk population explosion and then it'll go down and it's always in this state of flux sort of around some around some central point of uh of i don't know what word to use of of something that works for the forest or for the plains or for the prairie or whatever it is and it comes go, go ahead go ahead well i, I was gonna i was just going to respond i think yes i i largely agree with that concept that that uh these things change in that uh and often in unpredictable ways and and uh and it, it, our best thing is to try to learn what we can from it, but not try to substantially change it. And uh, uh, and and it may be that you know, using you know the example of elk, uh, it may be that elk will go uh, extinct locally, uh, or or uh, you know over a region um, over time, and and maybe that's the proper thing. I certainly. Uh, as long as it isn't due to something like we're poisoning the soil or something um, that contributes to that, uh, I would say, well, that's, that's probably okay. Um, uh, I can live with it. So um, 
you mentioned just in passing that um, that we see we as a people see predators as um, competitors. I believe was the word you used, and mm -hmm. it seems to me, and you know, we can disagree on this. It seems to me that the hatred of predators is deeper than simply economic competitors. Um, the, there's there's this this uh, level of um, viciousness, I think, that with which, um, or I'm just going to say hatred. There, it seems to me that there is a hatred of of um, of a lot of predators that goes beyond mere sort of implacable economic thought. And I'm wondering. I, I'm thinking of something that I remember reading a long time ago that when the Europeans arrived in this continent, that um, soon after they got here, one of the things that there, there was a, a group of Indian nations in the Northeast who, who got together to talk about this because they couldn't figure out why the white people were killing all the wolves. And they basically thought about it and talked about it over a certain length of time. And by the end of their time together, they basically all they could come up with is they think that the white people were crazy. And well, I yeah, wanna, I, so what, what is, it seems to me that there is this sort of, which I don't believe is evolutionary. I don't believe that all, I mean, for crying out loud, prior to conquest, along rivers in California, you would see a grizzly bear every 15 minutes. So obviously the Talawa, who lived here for 12,500 years, were not wiping out the grizzly bears. So I don't think it's that we're primates who are scared of them. What, but, but it seems to me that there is this, this, this real thing against predators. Well, let me respond two things. I'll tell you one little fact that sort of an antidote to what you started to say about the uh, settlers. And one of the first things that was done in the Massachusetts Bay Colony was a bounty back in 1630. So we're talking real early. You know, the pilgrims got there in 1620. Uh, one of the first things they did was uh, put a bounty on wolves and Indians. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're, we're seen as being the same, you know, in the same, uh, you know, light as uh, problematic, so to speak. And uh, so that's a that that sort of substantiates, you know, your point about very early on uh, the settlers and colon, uh, uh, colonists were trying to get rid of uh, predators. And and you know, it seems like um, I'll go a little. Not directly answer your question, but uh, but I want to I, I do want to take a stab because you made me think of this at explaining one of the uh, issues going on today, which is uh, the predators, particularly the wolf, have come to symbolize to many people in this country a bigger issue. In other words, it's not just that uh, the economic issue that that wolves may eat elk or eat my sheep or cows. It is that um, the uh, wolves are are put into as a symbol of federal government in rural, particularly in the rural West, and and uh, even more so of uh, more recently uh, the influence of uh, you know the Obama administration in the view of rural Westerners trying to quote shove wolves down our throats. Uh, so what happens is that. The uh, reaction to wolves gets wrapped up in all these other things, gun control. You know, you, you, you're putting wolves out there so you can come and take our guns away. Um, it, you know, those are the kinds of analogies that are drawn, and, I, and I'm not exaggerating at all. And there are, uh, you know, there's a, you know, there's even perhaps a little bit of uh, racism involved. Um, there was a picture that was on the internet last year of some hunters um, dressed up in white hoods. Uh, with the dead wolf in uh, in Jackson, Wyoming, that they put on their uh, uh, website, and uh, proud that they killed this wolf, and they're all wearing white hoods, and you know it doesn't take too much of a jump and leap in imagination that we see the Ku Klux Klan there, and that the wolf is you know the new black man of the neighborhood that they're trying to get rid of, and um, so uh, you know to get to your point, there there's a visceral thing that's going on reaction that. Um, Probably all along, but certainly in modern times, uh, these predators have come to symbolize uh, larger issues of that uh, where people are afraid and uh, of various things, whatever it is, and uh, 
they can't control these things. So they, they really don't feel like they have control over the federal government. They don't, you know, they see the demographics of the United States changing. They don't have any control over that. But they feel like they can control at least uh, wolves or, or mountain lions or whatever by, you know, killing and trapping them and so forth. And, and so it gives them a sense of security in a world where they feel insecure uh, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, have have this control over an animal, and and I think that that is one of the reasons why uh, you get this visceral reaction that doesn't even make sense. You know, in other words, I can I'll use one example in Montana, which I'm real familiar with. Um, the uh, you will read all the time letters to the editor. You'll see things from the Rocky Mountain Elk Fighting Basin and other um, hunter uh, uh, organizations. Uh, saying that wolves are decimating the elk herd. And yet, uh, since wolves have been reintroduced into a lot of Montana, there's actually almost double the number of elk today as there was before there were wolves. And so clearly, wolves are not decimating hunting opportunity or the elk herds. But that hasn't stopped groups like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and many uh, anti-wolf uh, advocates from asserting that so and, and and you can say well you know go to the montana fishing game department which is not pro wolf by the way but look at their numbers you know they, they have it there in black and white and then the reaction of course is that, that that's a conspiracy because secretly the montana fishing game department is actually wants wolves too so it, 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 even if you present facts um uh, that are you know, I mean, the numbers are so large as to be indisputable. I mean, we can argue that maybe there's a 140,000 elk as opposed, or 100, as opposed to 150,000 elk in Montana today, whatever. But the, the point is there's way more elk than there was before there were wolves. And yet that reality is not acknowledged by those who are against having predators on the landscape. And I think, again, because the predators are symbolic of something more than merely uh, animals that might compete with them for, you know, uh, the ability to kill an elk uh, or, uh, or protect their livestock. And um, but it's symbolic of something much larger. And I would say for uh, wolf advocates, too, you know, sort of turn it around, um, there, there is a lot of symbolism on the other side as well. Uh, a, a lot of the people that are wolf advocates feel, feel, and, and I would put myself in this category, feel that restoring wolves is a is a a way to make amends for all the damage that we've done to the planet, and that it's a process of healing. And by uh, so so wolf restoration becomes symbolic of an attempt to uh, heal the the wounds that we've created by our actions in the past. So we're more passionate about, you know, having wolves back on the landscape than, than merely just saying, oh, we, you know, I, I mean, I can, I can, as I did at the beginning, I can give you all these sort of uh, reasons why I think there's uh, good ecological reasons for having predators, but that isn't really the, the main reason why I am a wolf advocate. I'm an advocate because I see it as, as symbolic of a larger acknowledgement of past, um, and not to get you know uh, preachy about it, but past sins, you might say, uh, that we've made a, a, to the land. And this is a, a, a way to symbolize um, uh, our, and acknowledge that we would like to try to heal our relationship to the land. And by restoring predators and accepting predators and learning to live with predators, it teaches us how to better live on the planet as a whole. And, uh, and if we can learn to live with predators and accept predators, um, we are then going to be in a better position for uh, healing what we've done to the planet overall in many other ways. And maybe, you know, it, it isn't nearly as easy as, just having some uh, wolves come back. But since a lot of the things that we've done are the result of the way we think and the way that we uh, act, uh, if we can change our thinking and our behavior, uh, then we have a better chance of, of uh, ultimately 
uh, living in a more sane uh, relationship with uh, all the life around us. So I, I think that that's really brilliant, and I think that the, everything you've said has been really great, and um, and we're pretty much out of time. So I, I, would I guess I want to ask one quick question, which is, so one of the reasons I do these programs is to not merely change people's thinking, but to change their actions. And, and so if somebody listens to this, um, what do you want them to do in terms of specifically having to do with uh, predator advocacy? Um, I think that the thing that we need to do is change um, the politics around uh, predator management and take it away from fishing departments who have a, a bias uh, to kill predators and to uh, uh, demand that um, that we have our, our wildlife is uh, allowed to uh, operate and function um, uh, at the ecosystem level and that we change our whole premise that we, that, that for example, elk and deer are there merely for us to kill for our own use, uh, but that we realize that uh, the predators are very important for, um, our, and, and the way we treat predators is very important for our whole relationship to uh, the planet. Okay, and, and now even though I said that, I have one more real quick question, which is yeah. they make you predator czar tomorrow, and you can actually do policy. Um, what do you what do you do? Do you do you simply stop wildlife services from killing them, or do you do more proactive stuff too? Well, uh, yeah, I think you know the, I think the wolves or cougar and all that are, are in most cases are perfectly able to to be on their own. I might be an advocate of reintroducing them in places. Uh, where they've been eliminated a long time ago, where they're not likely to get to anytime soon, like the East Coast. But in general, uh, just leaving them alone uh, is the main thing. Uh, just um, no longer have a war upon predators, uh, and they'll probably uh, do fine. Okay, well, thank you so much for your work, and thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been George Wertner. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.